Hello everyone, Helen here. How are you doing? I hope you're doing all right. I'm welcoming you back into the camper van again uh, this this episode, uh, as promised last time. Uh, took you on part one of our camper van trip to Wales last time and I said I would finish it off uh, this week. So yeah, so I hope you're going to enjoy it. So last time we drove south from where we live in Durham to uh, Llangollen in North Wales and had a lovely time uh, doing all sorts of things there. And then we drove a bit further south in Wales so that I could go to Wonderwall and so that Phil, that's my husband, uh, could go on a walk in the Brecon Beacons or the ba Banai Brechiniog. Oh, I've got to try and remember that new name for them. Anyway, so we had a really, really great time. And, and talking of Wonderwall, uh, in that particular podcast, which was a couple of episodes ago, uh, I showed you a little video of the different sheep that I'd seen at the Yarn Festival. And the last one that I showed you, I, I asked if anybody knew what it was because I just couldn't remember. So thank you to those of you who uh, told me what it was. It wasn't a sheep at all. It was a goat <laughs> and it was the Welsh Angora goat. As soon as you, uh, I read that, I thought, oh, yes, I remember seeing the goats. Anyway, they're absolutely gorgeous goats um, and they're so, the, the fleece looks so soft and silky and oh, curly. I do love curls. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, apparently uh, Angora goats originate uh, from Turkey, from the region around Ankara or is it Ankara? I'm not sure how you say it, uh, but Ankara, Angora. That's the Angora comes from that area. So, and the the fleece of the Angora goats are used to make mohair, mohair yarn. So that was really interesting to find that out. Uh, so thank you again <laughs> for letting me know. So anyway, back to our trip in the camper van. And when I left you last, we were just on our way to visit my auntie who lives near the town of Ludlow in the county of Shropshire, which is just on the Welsh border. So it's not actually in Wales, it's in England. And uh, although I've called this podcast part two of our camper van trip to Wales, none of the places I'm taking you today are actually in Wales. <laughs> so once we'd arrived at my auntie's house, we had a lovely stroll around her beautiful garden with her. And I have really loved meeting her four hens. Uh, one of whom was particularly friendly. The others weren't so sure about me at first. Well, I'm sure they'd have got used to me if I'd stayed a bit longer. We did take home some of their eggs and I have to say they were so tasty. We really enjoyed our stay, spending time with my auntie as well as having the luxury of a proper bed and a bathroom and a shower. <laughs> it was really, really nice. So on Monday morning, we drove the short distance into Ludlow which is a very lovely little market town, uh, quite close to the English-Welsh border. There are loads of historic buildings in the town and we wandered around for quite a while with my auntie as a guide for some other time. Uh, we visited the Church of St Lawrence, which is known locally as the Cathedral of the Marches. So it's one of the largest uh, parish churches in England and it did feel rather like a cathedral inside. And the marches are the Welsh marches, the borderlands between England and Wales. It really is a very fine church and well worth taking the time to visit. It was established in Norman times in the late 11th century, but much of the building that we see today uh, took place in the 15th century when, other, when a lot of major rebuilding of the church took place, uh, including the central tower, which is about 135 feet high, which is about 41 metres, and it's built in the perpendicular style of architecture. It has a carillon that plays a different tune each day of the week 
So it's a bit like a giant music box and this is the original mechanical one, although these days the tune is produced digitally and unfortunately we forgot to return in time to hear the tune of that day, so I was a bit sorry about that. Uh, one of the interesting things about Ludlow is that it was a planned town. It's laid out on a grid system and the planning and building of the town took place in Norman times about a thousand years ago. There are so many beautiful buildings, from medieval ones to elegant Georgian houses. There are about 500 listed buildings in Ludlow. This pub, for example, has been trading for over 600 years. I, I love the wonkiness of this building here. I'm sure it must have a few stories to tell about its history. And the Feathers Hotel is renowned for being a treasure of a house both inside and out and it dates back to the early 1600s, and it's still in use as a hotel today. It really is a very interesting place to visit if you're interested in history and architecture, and when you walk through the streets, you can spot lots of blue plaques attached to buildings, which give all sorts of interesting facts about their history, such as the shops and workshops that used to be housed in the buildings maybe seven, several centuries ago. Before saying goodbye to my auntie, she took us to her favourite tea room in Ludlow, called Carvel's, and I can really understand why she loves it. I do love a good traditional tea room. The surroundings are charming, and the mismatched china, and we enjoyed the cosiness as we drank our cups of tea, accompanied by toasted tea cake. After that, Phil and I spent another hour or so wandering round the town. Ludlow has been a thriving market town for many centuries and we were fortunate to be there on a market day. We had a great time looking at all the market stalls. There was an amazing licorice stall that sells licorice from all around Europe and we couldn't resist buying an assortment to sample. Some old favourites and some completely new to us. I loved the painted birds on this stall which was raising funds for an orphanage in Africa all of the items for sale were made by people local to the African orphanage. This hat stall had a huge range of high quality hats and after some deliberation Phil decided to buy one, although I haven't got a photo of him modelling his new hat yet. I was rather attracted to this stall selling gemstones and I had a good chat with the stall holder about all the different gems that he sells. I bought two stones that I was really drawn to. I just love the feel of these palm-sized smooth gemstones and I find them a good way of calming myself if I'm feeling a bit troubled or anxious just by holding one in my hand and curling my fingers over it. We also shopped at a nearby specialist cheese shop and bought a selection of local cheeses. We often do that when we're away somewhere. We really like sampling the local delicacies that we might not have come, come across before. After buying some hot pork stuffing and apple sauce baguettes from this lovely little shop for our lunch, we returned to the van to eat them and then soon got on our way again, driving north through Shropshire. We stopped a little later to make cups of tea in the Carding Mill Valley and that obviously has a link with the preparation of fleeces and wool in the past, doesn't it? Carding mill. It's quite a peaceful place, despite its popularity. And I had some quiet crochet time there while Phil went off on a little walk. Then we drove out of the valley and up onto the ridge above, which is called the Long Mind. And that forms the backbone of the Shropshire Hills the highest point being nearly 1,600 feet, and which is over 500 metres. We paused to take in the wonderful views. There were clear views all round and we could see quite a distance away. And we were also met by a very friendly pair of sheep who were possibly hoping for a nice snack or something. I don't know, they were very inquisitive indeed, not at all fearful of us uh, or the van. And the lamb, who seemed to like nibbling shoelaces, was also so inquisitive that he almost got bashed on the head by the van. Um, anyway, he was fine. We enjoyed the drive back down to the valley below.
We continued to head in a northerly direction and in the early evening we parked by the side of a quiet road to cook our tea. It was just pasta and a mushroom and onion sauce and it was very quick to put together uh, with the help of a tin of condensed mushroom soup which I'd found uh, had been in our store cupboard for quite a long time. It was fine though. And I know it all looks rather grey but it was actually very tasty. <laughs> We, we then drove further north and were turned to an overnight spot up on the moors in Lancashire, where we'd stopped once before. Caton Moor really is a lovely location to stay in, though it is actually quite popular with the younger locals as a meeting place during the evenings and dog walkers first thing in the morning, but no one disturbed us and no one else was there overnight. We woke to a clear sunny day, we could see for miles around, all the way west to Lancaster and Morecambe and the sea beyond. We weren't disturbed at all by the wind turbines that were right next to the car park, which just gave a barely noticeable gentle whooshing sound. Whenever I look at wind turbines, I always think how amazing it is that people have worked out how to harness the power of the wind to produce energy for us to use. After breakfast, we headed down the hill, appreciating the views and passing several sheep who seemed quite relaxed about crossing the road, despite the fact that we were bigger and faster than them. I guess they must have sensed that they had the right of way. <laughs> we continued travelling northwards, eventually passing into the Yorkshire Dales and going through lots of pretty little villages with their stone-built cottages surrounded by rolling hills. By lunchtime, we arrived in the small town of Sedva in the county of Cumbria, just south of the English Lake District. It's another very attractive little market town and it was an important trading place from at least the 13th century, owing to the confluence of four rivers and the merging of some ancient trading routes. In 2003, the town took on the role as a book town, which was a way of encouraging visitors back to the area following the terrible outbreak of foot and mouth disease in 2001. There's certainly a fair number of bookshops uh, in Sedva. I think we counted six. And we also like uh, the bus shelter, which has been turned into a book shelter, which was looking very beautiful, shaded by this tree of pink blossom. And it's just a place for borrowing a book or replacing it with an unwanted book of your own. Of course, we couldn't resist investigating some of the bookshops. One of the second-hand bookshops is huge and it would be very easy to lose all track of time in there and spend at least half a day in there, though we didn't have too long on this occasion. In another little shop which sold vintage books as well as outdoor gear, I found two very interesting old children's books from the early 1900s which I bought to add to my small collection of vintage children's books. So this is one of the books that caught my attention, Table Talks and Table Travels, and it was apparently published around about 1900. And it is, it's an educational book for children. And in the note at the start, it says, Cocoa, sugar, bread, butter, eggs, etc. have each a story to tell of adventures gone through before they reached the breakfast table. And as these and others give up their secrets, the children learn how the commonest things of daily life link us with the ends of the earth. And so we learn all about how the table came into being, the tablecloth, the tray, cocoa and sugar and bread and butter and eggs and honey and the honeybee. And there's a few... Um, about eight, I think it is, coloured illustrations there. And so it begins with all of the uh, things on the table talking to each other about wanting to tell their stories. But it begins with the table's story, and beginning with how the pine tree grew. Long, long ago, a tall pine tree grew in a forest in Finland. A cone fell from its branches, and out of it dropped a tiny seed. I was inside that little seed. Yes, you may stare, but it is true. Of course, I was not a table then, but listen. And so it goes on through the tree growing and being cut down. 
and the logs going on their travels. And finally, the log, the logs being turned into a table. And we have the tablecloth story. Most of you children know that the tablecloth is made of linen. Did you know that linen is made from a plant called the flax plant? A long time ago, people used to make their own tablecloths. They grew the flax, made it into thread and wove it into cloth. There were no weaving machines then, so they had to weave by hand. And so we go through how a tablecloth is made. Oh, and it is such a delightful book. There are so many lovely illustrations and it's just written in such an appealing way. It's also teaching children reading the book about children in other places around the world. And oh, that is just such a beautiful book. And I've really enjoyed reading through it and actually learning things as well. So really, really lovely. I'm very, very pleased with that little find. The other book that caught my attention was this one, Big Peter's Little Peter. Beautiful illustration on the front cover. And it was apparently uh, uh, published around about 1918. Got some beautiful colour illustrations in it and the thing that really attracted me to it was just something that was unusual about it and that was that whenever the child in the story or anybody else for that matter is singing we have the little bits of music uh, and because I can read music and read it and then get the sounds in my head without even going to play it on anything <laughs> then I it's like reading words and then reading music and it becomes a, an even richer story. Uh, so they're really lovely. And later on as well, I think it's Christmas time and we've got music from Come All Ye Faithful here and and here. Um, I don't, I've no idea if it's a very good, uh, you know, great work of literature, but it's just a beautiful book. Look at that gorgeous illustration. So I'm looking forward to actually to reading it, finding out what the story is about. But yeah, lovely book. There's also a craft shop in Sedba selling all sorts of locally made handcrafted items. I was very tempted by the baskets made of differently coloured willow, but I did resist the temptation to buy one on this occasion. Uh, though I did buy one or two things in there, including these small bags of dyed fleece. I was especially attracted by the curly locks, you won't be surprised to learn. Um, and I plan to use them for a needle felting project that I have in mind. We thoroughly enjoyed our wander around Sedbur, but before long it was time to set off for home and enjoy the last of the Yorkshire scenery until we next return. We had a minor hold up to begin with when we came across a farmer carrying two lambs to another field. <laughs> being closely followed by a rather concerned mother sheep. That was quite funny. But the rest of the journey was uneventful and we were in good spirits driving through the green hills in the late spring sunshine. So there we have it, another camper van trip over. But fear not, we have more plans for the not too distant future and I'll be sure to take you along uh, when, we, when we go off on those. So for, for now, I just uh, hope you have a lovely week ahead, not too busy and take good care of yourself. I'll be back soon. Okay then. Bye.